On Friday, Congress finally passed and President Bush signed into law a financial rescue package in which the taxpayers will buy up Wall Street's bad investments. The numbers are staggering, but they don't begin to explain the greed and incompetence that created this mess. It began with a terrible bet that was magnified by reckless borrowing, complex securities, and a vast, unregulated shadow market worth nearly $60 trillion that hid the risks until it was too late to do anything about them. And it's far from being over. It started out 16 months ago as a mortgage crisis. Then it slowly evolved into a credit crisis. Now it's something entirely different and much more serious. What kind of a crisis is it today? This is a full-blown uh, financial storm and one that comes around perhaps uh, one every 50 or 100 years. This is the real thing. Jim Grant is the editor of Grant's Interest Rate Observer and one of the country's foremost experts on credit markets. He says it didn't have to happen. That this disaster was created entirely by Wall Street itself during a time of relative prosperity. And they did it by placing a trillion dollar bet with mostly borrowed money that the riskiest mortgages in the country could be turned into gold-plated investments. If you look at how this started with the subprime crisis, it doesn't seem to be a good bet to put your money behind the idea that people with the lowest income and the poorest credit ratings are going to be able to, to pay off their mortgages. The idea that you could lend money to someone who couldn't pay it back is not an inherently attractive idea to the layman, right? However, it seemed to fly with people who were making $10 million a year. With clients clamoring for safe investments with above average return, the big Wall Street investment houses bought up millions of the least dependable mortgages, chopped them up into tiny bits and pieces, and repackaged them as exotic investment securities that hardly anyone could understand. This is actually the security. This is the selling document for the security. So this is We looked at one of them with Frank Partnoy, a former derivatives broker and corporate securities attorney who now teaches law at the University of San Diego. It's hundreds and hundreds of pages of, of very small print with a lot of detail here. Think anybody ever read this stuff? I doubt very many people read it. These complex financial instruments were actually designed by mathematicians and physicists who used algorithms and computer models to reconstitute the unreliable loans in ways that were supposed to eliminate most of the risk. Obviously, they turned out to be wrong. Why? Because you can't model human behavior with math. How much of this catastrophe had to do with the instruments that, the, that Wall Street created and, and chose to buy? Uh, and the, sell. In, the instruments themselves are at the heart of this mess. They are complex, in effect, mortgage science projects devised by these Nobel track physicists who came to work on Wall Street for the very purpose of creating complex instruments with all manner of, 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 of detailed protocols on who gets paid when and how much. And the complexity of these structures is at the very center of the crisis of credit today. People don't know what they're made up of, how they're going to behave. Right. But it didn't stop the rating agencies like Standard & Poor's and Moody's from certifying the dodgy securities investment grade. And it didn't stop Wall Street from making billions selling them to banks, pension funds, and other institutional investors all over the world. But that was just the beginning of the crisis. What most people outside of Wall Street and Washington don't know is that a lot of the people who bought these risky mortgage securities also went out and bought even more arcane investments that Wall Street was peddling called credit default swaps. And they've turned out to be a much bigger problem. They are private and largely undisclosed contracts that mortgage investors entered into to protect themselves in case their investments went bad. Part of a huge unregulated market that's multiplied the losses. They've already helped bring down three of the biggest firms on Wall Street and threaten the ones that are left. But before your eyes glaze over, Michael Greenberger, a law professor at the University of Maryland and a former director of trading and markets for the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, says they're much simpler than they sound. What is a, a credit default swap? A credit default swap is a contract between two people, one of whom is giving insurance to the other that he will be paid in the event that a financial institution or a financial instrument fails. So it, it's an insurance contract? 
It is an insurance contract, but they've been very careful not to call it that because if it were insurance, it would be regulated. So they use a magic substitute word called a swap, which by virtue of federal law is deregulated. So anybody who was nervous about buying these mortgage-backed securities, these, these CDOs, they would be sold a credit default swap as sort of an insurance policy. A credit default swap was available to them, marketed to them as a risk-saving device for buying a risky financial instrument. But there was a problem. Oh, there was a big problem. What was the problem? Well, the problem was that if it were insurance or, or called what it really is, the person who sold the policy would have to have capital reserves to be able to pay in the case the insurance was called upon or triggered. But because it was a swap and not insurance, there was no requirement that adequate capital reserves be put to the side. Now, who was selling these credit default swaps? Bear Stearns was selling them. Lehman Brothers was selling them. AIG was selling them. You know, the names we hear that are in trouble, Citi Group was selling them. These investment banks were not only selling the securities that turned out to be terrible investments, they were selling insurance on them? Well, it made, the, it, made it easier to sell the terrible investments if you could convince the buyer that not only were they going to get the investment, but insurance. But when homeowners began defaulting on their mortgages and Wall Street's high-risk mortgage-backed securities also began to fail, the big investment houses and insurance companies who sold the credit default swaps hadn't set aside the money they needed to pay off all the insurance contracts they'd written. Bear Stearns was the first to go under, selling itself to J.P. Morgan for pennies on the dollar. Then Lehman Brothers declared bankruptcy. And when AIG, the nation's largest insurer, couldn't cover its bad debts, the government stepped in with an $85 billion rescue. What role did the credit default swaps play in this financial disaster? They were the centerpiece, really. That's why the banks lost all the money. They lost all the money based on those side bets, based on the mortgages. How big is the market for credit default swaps? We really don't know. There's this voluntary survey that claims that the market is in the range of 50 to 60 or so trillion dollars. It's sort of alarming that in a market that big, we don't even know how big it is to within, say, 10 trillion dollars, but... 60 trillion dollars? 60 trillion dollars. I know it seems incredible. It's four times the size of the U.S. debt, but that's the size of the market according to these voluntary reports. And the market's totally unregulated. And this market is um, almost entirely unregulated. The result is a huge shadow market that may control our financial destiny, and yet the details of these private insurance contracts are hidden from the public, from stockholders, and from federal regulators. No one knows what they cover, who owns them, or whether or not they have the money to pay them off. One of the few sources of information is the International Swaps and Derivatives Association, a trade organization made up of the largest financial institutions in the world. Many of them are the very same companies that created the vast shadow market, lobbied to keep it unregulated, and are now drowning there because of unanticipated risks. The CEO, Robert Pickle, says there's nothing wrong with credit default swaps. The problem was the underlying mortgage securities. Well, there's clearly something wrong with the system if all of these leveraged bets, hidden leveraged bets, caused a collapse in the financial system. It's, it is something that we all need to look at and learn lessons from, and we all need to work together to understand that in the future and, and design a, a structure in the future that, that works more effectively. Yeah, my, my point is the people that made these mistakes are the people you represent in your organization, and many of them sit on the board. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, if they didn't get it right, who would? These, these people understand uh, the nature of these products. They well, understand obviously the they didn't, or they wouldn't have bought them. They wouldn't have used them. These are very uh, useful transactions, and if people do understand the nature of the risks that they're entering into. Well, if but they're I'm so, much, if I, they're so sure useful, that, how come they brought down the financial system? Because it, perhaps they didn't understand the underlying risk uh, in, in, in nobody, nobody really saw the effects that were going to flow through from the subprime lending situation. That chapter is not over. 
and there is much suspense and fear on Wall Street that there are other big losses out there that have yet to be disclosed. They already dwarf what's been lost on those original risky mortgages. As bad as the mortgage crisis has been, 94% of all Americans are still paying off their loans. The problem is, Wall Street placed its huge bets and side bets with all those fancy securities on the 6% who are not. We wouldn't be in any of this trouble right now if we had just had underlying investments in mortgages. We wouldn't be in any trouble right now. It's all the side bets. It's the side bets. You've got all these big Wall Street firms, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, you've got insurance companies like, like AIG, Merrill lost a ton of money on this. Everybody's lost a ton of money. They're supposed to be the, the smartest investors in the world, and they did it themselves. They did it all on their own. That's the most incredible thing about this crisis is that they pushed the button themselves. They blew themselves up. Now, how much of this was just incompetence on the yeah. part of Wall Street, the people who ran it? The truth is that on Wall Street, a lot of people just weren't very good at their jobs. It's as simple as that. These people were being paid 50 to $100 million a year. Some of them, the guys that were running the places. There is no defending uh, the, uh, a trainee making $45,000 a year would have had the common sense not to bet the firm on mortgage contraptions that no one in the firm actually understood. That is not a deep point to comprehend. Somehow, through, I will call it a criminal neglect and incompetence, the people at the top of these firms chose to look away, to take more risk, to enrich themselves, and to put the shareholders, and indeed, the country itself, ultimately, the country's economy at risk, and it is truly a, not only a shame, it's a crime. We requested interviews with top executives at Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, and AIG. They all declined. It's one of the biggest problems in America today, the out-of-control heroin epidemic. It's happening all over the country and forcing authorities to decide whether heroin should be treated as a medical or a legal problem. Last year, we reported that heroin is spreading through the Columbus, Ohio suburbs. Ohio has been hard hit by heroin, and we selected Columbus because the area is middle America personified where companies have gone for years to test and market new products. Now, it's where drug dealers, many of them from Mexico, are marketing their cheap and increasingly powerful heroin. We decided to go back to Ohio this year to see what is being done or could be done to solve a problem that is killing at least 23 people in Ohio every week. Angie, what is this with all these names on the wall here? We call this the death wall. The death wall. Yes. Why is that? Majority of the people on this wall have died of drug overdose due to heroin. Angie Pelfrey, a former nurse and recovering opioids addict, runs the New Beginnings Rehab Facility in rural Piketon, Ohio. By 2010, we had about 50 names total. But now, 2016, we're over 3,000. It's incredible. It is incredible. Many of the names are mothers, brothers, even grandmothers, relatives or friends of Angie's residents. They come from all over the state, and nearly everyone knew people on the wall. That's almost everybody. There's 23 in there on the wall from my hometown. Is it a small town? Yeah. A new University of Cincinnati study says one in five Ohio residents knows someone who is struggling with heroin. One sheriff told us that up to 80% of the prisoners in his county jail have drugs in their system, largely heroin. What can law enforcement do? The attorney general is not going to solve the problem. Uh, your local sheriff, your local prosecutor is not going to. Ohio Attorney General Mike DeWine is also a former senator and congressman. We've been fighting a war on drugs now for decades. If this is the biggest epidemic that you have seen, this heroin epidemic, it sounds like we're not winning that war. You know, I've been involved um, in law enforcement for four decades. And I've learned over those years that we're not going to arrest our way out of this problem. That's why Mike DeWine says he's encouraged by a different kind of court in Ohio. Congratulations. They're drug courts and deal only with drug cases. There are 91 in Ohio. 
We went to one in Columbus that was being run at the time by Judge Scott Vanderkar. He was handling only heroin cases four times a week. The judge believes heroin addiction is an illness, and in his court, heroin addicts are treated more like patients than criminals. And how long have you been clean? I've been clean for 84 days. There are students in the courtroom, a teacher, a state employee, the CEO of a tech company. If they come here for up to two years, get drug tested, and stay clean, their heroin charges are dismissed. You sort of use the carrot and the stick. Absolutely. You stick with the program, or I'll put you back in jail. I'll put you back in jail, and you're going to end up with a conviction on your record. Right before I went into, into detox... Under I, Judge Vanderkar, 250 addicts went through the program, people who might otherwise be in jail or dead. You get resistance from other judges? Absolutely. So what's, what's their criticism? It's too touchy-feely? Yes, it's too social work. That's not my job. My job's to be a judge. Drug courts work. Uh, some people look at them and say, well, it's, you know, it's the judge becoming a social worker. It's not true at all. It worked for Caitlin and Robert, not their real names. They were both arrested for heroin possession and went to Judge Vanderkar's court after being addicted to heroin for years. It was this, like, really, like, animal instinct level, like, obsession with, with getting high. You had when, to do it. Even when I didn't want to, like, really using against my will. Where did you get the money? Stealing, lying, cheating, um, using other people. Um, ripping other people off. I had no relationship with reality at all. Um, my, my thinking was limited to how I could get high. In Judge Vanderkar's court, they both were given a new chance. It's a gift. What's the gift? Life, a new way to live, you know, and try to give me a little bit of some education on why I'm acting the way I'm acting why I can't stop. They didn't treat us like criminals. I think that was a big thing. Yeah. After they passed random drug tests several times a week, went to therapy, and stayed clean for more than a year, their drug-related criminal charges were wiped off the books. Robert started a landscaping business. Caitlin is in pre-med and wants to be a doctor. It's freedom, and if I had those charges, I, I wouldn't be able to... Uh, continue on the path that I'm on now. There are a lot of law enforcement folks who do see your behavior as criminal and who do think you should be in jail for what you were doing. We did break the yeah. law, but I'm talking about branding someone a criminal for the rest of their lives. It just doesn't work. But it's been that way for years in many Ohio communities. We went to Hardin County, one hour outside of Columbus. I have eight felonies on my record that I will never be able to get rid of. Hardin County is now experimenting with a drug court, but it didn't exist when Jenna Morrison first started using heroin seven years ago. She's been arrested at least six times. Looked at this case, the old case. The prosecutor in Hardin County, Bradford Bailey, says he is overwhelmed by drug cases. He takes a harder line than Judge Vanderkar. We're going to get him because they don't have the ability to say no. They don't have the ability to stop using some of them. They don't. In 2011, Jenna Morrison overdosed and almost died. Prosecutor Bailey charged her with felony heroin possession, internal possession. I got charged with possession of heroin because I had it in my system. She was charged with a felony for that. That's what it is. It's a Schedule One drug. No one can have it in their possession under any circumstance, not even medicinal. Isn't that a bit extreme? No, that's the law of Ohio. That's the law of the United States of America. Jenna Morrison is no poster child for sobriety, but Judge Vanderkar told us prosecutors have discretion and it's unusual to charge addicts who've overdosed with possession because a drug is in their system, as Prosecutor Bailey did. Jenna sold a police informant, small numbers of pain pills, and a drug that helps wean addicts from heroin. Bailey came down hard with nine counts of felony trafficking. When Jenna and her sister stole cash and credit cards from their mother to support their heroin habits, 
Bailey charged them with felony theft. I couldn't stop them. I filed charges on my own daughters. That's At her wit's end, it was Tracy Morrison who called the police. It resulted in five felony charges for one, three for the other. Felony charges. Felony charges. See, I was thinking, because I'm naive, that 100 bucks is petty theft. Well, no, they got them for forgery and uh, all these felonies. And um, then they were trying to send them to prison. And I, thought this, I just didn't even expect that to happen. Since she first used heroin seven years ago, Jenna Morrison has been charged with 23 felonies. Todd Anderson is her lawyer. So they're taking these low-level users and addicts, charging all these felonies, and then the problem is, is that they stack the sentences on them. And then when they violate their probation or something, they're getting lengthy prison sentence for really being an addict. The county prosecutor would say there's just no denying she broke the law. I agree with that, but the issue is what we do with them and what's the sentence. The sentence has got to be fair. When we first met Jenna last year, she had kicked her heroin habit with the help of a new drug called Vivitrol, which blocks the effects of opioids in the brain. She went back to school and was managing to take care of her children, but she was still posted on Prosecutor Bailey's website as a drug trafficker, and she couldn't find a job. Her mother says she got depressed and started using cocaine. She recently was locked up again, and the prosecutor charged her with five more felonies, making a total of 28. 18 have been dismissed, 10 remain on her record. You think she's been treated fairly? Where has she been untreated unfairly? Everything she's done, she chose to do. We didn't tell her to do these things. She chose to do felony crimes, not the state. We're not giving her a free pass. We don't give anybody a free pass. But you also know that she's addicted to heroin. I have a lot of people who are addicted to heroin. Most of the people that are in our drug business, the illegal drug business, are addicted. Yes. Prosecutor Bailey says the voters have told him they want drug addicts off the street. But Scott Vanderkar says law enforcement needs to recognize the old tough-on-drugs approach isn't working, that addicts like Jenna need help, not punishment. He recently resigned his judgeship to help other communities in Ohio set up their own drug courts. He meets with judges and elected officials like Greg Peterson, the mayor of Dublin, Ohio. I don't want anybody in Dublin to have a problem and ever think I don't know where to turn. But many parents in the Columbus suburbs told us they don't know where to turn, even if they can afford private health insurance to pay for rehab and detox programs. Christy and Wayne Campbell's son, Tyler, was a star high school and college football player and a heroin addict. He was in and out of rehab three times, short rehabs, because most insurance companies limit the length of inpatient treatment. The last one that he was in, he was in there two weeks, and the insurance company wanted to release him. Christy convinced the insurance company to give Tyler two more weeks. When he came home, there was there was something obviously different. I mean, he like he got it. He was talking about the future. Yes, about the this future. this is midnight. So we go to bed with the biggest sigh of relief that you could ever have. It's over. Tomorrow's gonna be a great day. But tomorrow never came. Tyler went up to his bedroom, shot up, and overdosed. New beginnings. This is Angie. At the New Beginnings Rehab okay. Facility, yeah, Angie heroin. Pelfrey told us what happened to Tyler is not unusual. They get to a point to where they're not using, they go out and want to use maybe one more time, just one more hurrah, um, and it takes their life because they, they go back to using the same amount that they did when they were ending the addiction. Their tolerance goes down after right. two weeks of rehab. Right. They go home, shoot up the same amount they were using before. Yes, and it's taken their and lives. And it's now an overdose. Right. Angie Pelfrey's facility is a faith-based program supported by a church and the local community. Addicts can stay without paying for up to a year. But Angie has to turn away up to 20 people every day. There just aren't enough beds. That's in regards to my son. He's a heroin addict and he's asking for help. He needs help or he's going to die. Um, you can call me anytime. Thank you so much. It's horrible to know that you have to tell a mother that you're sorry, that you can't take them, um, knowing that there is a good chance they may not live till the next day. It's a day-to-day -day struggle. 
Angie says the odds of staying clean after a year at New Beginnings are only 50-50. What do you think about what you're seeing and experiencing? My fear is that it's never ending. That's my fear. Never ending? Never ending. I'm not seeing an end to it anywhere. We first met Chef Jose Andres seven years ago in the wildly popular restaurant he'd opened in Beverly Hills. Andres was born in Spain, but America is where he became famous for his avant-garde approach to cooking. He has nearly 30 restaurants here now, but he's barely set foot in any of them in the past two months, not since Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico. Andres went to the devastated island a few days after the storm to see how he could help. He's not a disaster relief expert, so he began doing what he does best. He found a kitchen, bought some ingredients, and began to cook. It's a good Thanksgiving story because that first day, Andres and his small team made about a thousand meals. Since then, he's recruited an army of chefs and volunteers, and together they've served more than three million meals to the hungry people of Puerto Rico. Voy subiendo, voy bajando. Jose Andres is always on the move. Hey! In the kitchen, which has become his base of operations in San Juan, Boom. he's a culinary commander rallying his troops. Una más. Voy subiendo, voy bajando. Preparing meals for so many people is a massive undertaking, requiring trained chefs, thousands of volunteers, assembly lines of sandwiches. 900 on this table alone. Good ham, good cheese, a lot, a lot of, mayo. of mayo. There's a lot of mayonnaise here. Yeah. It's all the more remarkable because none of this was set up before Jose Andres got to Puerto Rico two months ago. No, I arrived Monday right after the hurricane. And I asked, who is in charge of feeding the people of Puerto Rico? And they told me, um, everybody, everybody's in charge. You know, when you have to fit an entire island, you need to have one, one person and one organization responsible. There has to be a plan. Has to be a plan and somebody has to be responsible for achieving that plan. Andres came up with his own plan to feed as many of the islands, nearly three and a half million people as possible. He started with $10,000 of his own money in cash and pockets full of credit cards. I mean, how do you arrive at a place, you know, you don't know where the food is, you don't know where access to water is. How did you get off the ground here? So for me, it was not difficult. The first thing I do, you're a chef. You go and you try to find a kitchen. Everybody was saying, it's no food, it's no food. Well, that was not true. The big food distribution companies had food because they had fuel, they had diesel. They kept the refrigerators and the freezers working. There was food here? Plenty of food. What was the problem? The problem was the urgency of now. Uh, it's a very simple thing when you're a cook. When you're hungry, you gather the food, you gather your helpers, you begin cooking, and then you start feeding people. He joined up with a local chef named Jose Enrique and other volunteers, cooking enormous pans of paella and stews in a parking lot in San Juan. It wasn't long before they were making more than 100,000 meals a day. How did you scale it up that quickly? Well, uh, you know one thing, when these moments happen, we have a tendency to think, oh, we have to feed three million people. Almost the idea is impossible. Seems and, overwhelming. Uh, it's totally overwhelming, but all of a sudden, imagine you began breaking this. We're gonna be doing now 25,000 meals. And when you do it well for two days, you increase it to 50,000. And when you do it well, you increase it to 100,000. And all of a sudden, you scale up in a way that is simple. It's a big pan. That's uh, chicken, chickpeas. We try to put a good amount of proteins, rice, every Puerto Rican, I love rice. Ingredients are often improvised. They cook whatever they can buy. Techniques are improvised as well. Jennifer Herrera says a prayer for Puerto Rico as she pours oil into each pan of rice. Que Dios bendiga Puerto Rico. Que Dios bendiga Puerto Rico. The time it takes her to say God bless Puerto Rico is the exact amount of oil she says she needs. How many blessings do you give Puerto Rico every day? Thousands of blessings. With the help of private donations and money from the federal government, 
Jose Andres' nonprofit organization, World Central Kitchen, has prepared more hot meals than any of the other bigger, more experienced disaster relief organizations here, like the Salvation Army and the Red Cross. Most agencies, if they're giving out food, they're giving out MREs or snacks or not hot meals. Americans should be receiving one plate a day of hot food. That's not too much to ask in America. An MRE is very expensive for the American taxpayer. A hot meal is more affordable, it's cheaper, it's what people really need, it's what people really want. They feel all of a sudden that you are caring for them, that America is caring for them. You're not just giving calories, you're giving attention to, to people. The calories are obvious, but this is a message of hope. This is a message we care, and be patient. Things eventually will get better. That message of hope is one Andres has been preaching for weeks on social media. So, great, we got the refrigerator and fresh produce. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Documenting his efforts to expand operations around the entire island. At the height of the emergency, he had 18 kitchens going at once. And used trucks, cars, and anyone he could find to deliver meals. All of a sudden, I have Homeland Security helping us deliver sandwiches and water in the most difficult areas of uh, the island. I had cooks from the U.S. Coast Guard helping us, volunteering. We were having uh, so many different men and women coming from, from the federal government helping us. There are still plenty of places that need the help. In this community, an hour south of San Juan, there's no electricity. This is the first hot meal this family has eaten in more than two weeks. Andres' dedication has inspired others in Puerto Rico to set up kitchens of their own. In a church perched in the mountains of Naguabo, Pastor Eliomar Santana and his parishioners cook hot meals for neighboring communities with the rice, beans, and sausages Andres has provided them. We have people here with no water, no, no lights. They, they lost everything in their house and they have stopped thinking on that for helping others. So even though some of your parishioners need help, they're still volunteering here? Yeah, they're still volunteering. They're still trying to help other people? They're still trying to help other people. Before delivering the food to a nearby housing project, Pastor Santana thanks God and then Jose Andres. In the church, when you were praying, you thanked God first, and second, you thanked Jose Andres. Yes, that's very important. But I have to say, always say, God first, then Jose. <laughs> well, Jose's in good company. Andres's presence has not been without controversy. He's been critical of the federal government's response to the hurricane, and after attending meetings with FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, he called their headquarters in San Juan the most inefficient place on earth. Was that the frustration that it was just bureaucratic? That there were a lot of meetings and you felt like things weren't getting done? We were already feeding 100,000 people a day and I needed their help to make sure we had money to keep buying the food, to keep feeding these never ending lease of people in need. And there is where, call it red tape, nothing was happening. FEMA did award Andres' World Central Kitchen two short-term contracts worth $11.5 million to provide 1.8 million meals. But the agency refused to grant them a third, longer-term contract. Andres thinks the overall response to disaster relief needs to change. The people of the federal government are great people. But then it's red tape that sometimes doesn't allow that same people to be successful. I didn't put the name emergency on FEMA. I didn't, but somebody's gonna have to tell me the meaning of emergency. To me, when we're talking about food, and this is the little thing I know, is that emergency in food means one thing. People are hungry. And when you're hungry, it's today. FEMA says, look, to negotiate a big contract, we hit, there's a bidding process. You have to have three different companies bidding on it, that there's federal government regulations. You say that gets in the way of Americans in Puerto Rico were hungry, and we were not delivering food quick enough. And what we did is we didn't plan, we didn't meet. We began cooking, and we began delivering food to the people in need in Puerto Rico. 
And what we need to make sure is that next time we are not negotiating contracts, that next time the federal government is ready to do what they are supposed to do next time something like this happens. Maybe an earthquake, maybe another hurricane, or maybe a terrorist attack. We need to make sure we are ready because the people of America don't deserve anything less. Jose Andres's passion for disaster relief is a far cry from what excited him when we first met him in his restaurant in Beverly Hills in 2010. That's, liquid nitrogen. That's liquid nitrogen. Back then, he was leading a kind of culinary revolution, pioneering innovations in molecular gastronomy, marrying science with food in surprising and playful ways. Are you ready for this? Because I believe your life is going to change forever. <laughs> I mean it. This is going to change my life? Uh, maybe. <laughs> OK. I don't know why I keep doing stories about food, because I don't really eat much and never really think much about food. But it's so interesting to me how, for you, food is at the center of everything. Anderson, food touches everything. Food is in our DNA. Food touches the economy. Food is science. Food is romanticism. Food is health. Food has many of the opportunities to have a better tomorrow. That philosophy is at the heart of Andres's humanitarian efforts around the globe. He founded World Central Kitchen after the earthquake in Haiti earthquake? in 2010. And, you know, I've been here more than 25 times to Haiti. This past June, months before Hurricane Maria yes. hit Puerto Rico, we met up with Andres in Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince. We said we should be having here the freshest fish every day. He supports an orphanage here and has established a job training program for local chefs. He's also spearheading an effort to reduce the widespread use of charcoal in cooking. Long-term exposure to smoke from cooking indoors on fires kills an estimated 4 million people worldwide every year, most of them women and children. Andres has provided cleaner burning propane gas stoves to more than 100 schools in Haiti, like this one in Port-au-Prince. I mean, focusing on stoves, on the idea of clean cook stoves, is not something that a lot of people think about. I am a cook. I feed the few but I've always been super interested in feeding the many. And when I've seen some of these women doing the change from the charcoal to the gas, everything changes around them. When we see this woman cooking in the street with charcoal and we eat the plate of food, we should all be asking ourselves how that plate of food can really become an agent of change. An agent of change? A true agent of change, one plate at a time. How is that? Jose Andres spent Thanksgiving in Puerto Rico, continuing to feed people one plate at a time. This has been his biggest undertaking thus far. Every time it's a rainbow, you know things are going to get better. He's scaling back now as the need for emergency food relief here lessens, but he's already thinking about how he can do it better the next time disaster strikes. Ah, muy bien. Gracias.